Good evening, ladies and uh, gentlemen. A very warm welcome to uh, UCL Laws for this inaugural lecture. My name is Pete Eckhout. I'm Dean of the Faculty. And it's uh, uh, a huge privilege to be able to uh, preside over this uh, inaugural lecture by Professor Anthony Julius. The inaugural lecture is a rite of passage as we have impressed upon Anthony. Uh, it's an opportunity for a new professor to inform a wider audience about their field of research and their research uh, agenda. Uh, and I'm particularly delighted to preside at this inaugural lecture because it really is a unique first for us here to have a chair in uh, law and the arts. It's not a chairman in law and the arts, it's just a chair. Um, um, and I'm hugely looking forward to the lecture. But really, my main role here uh, tonight is uh, simply, first of all, to introduce the chair for uh, tonight's lecture, Professor Joss Go Gohan, who is Professor of Modern Literary Theory uh, at Goldsmiths University of London. Um, uh, he is uh, also a practicing psychoanalyst uh, of the British Psychoanalytical Society. Uh, he's the author of, of numerous books uh, and articles on modern literature, uh, cultural theory and psychoanalysis. Again, I think for uh, an inaugural lecture at UCL Laws, quite a bit of a first, uh, that uh, sort of field of research. Uh, his books include How to Read Freud uh, and The Private Life, Why We Remain in the Dark, and the, his book, which we, he will publish in uh, January 2019, looks particularly interesting to me, Not Working, Why We Have to Stop on inertia in psychic and cultural life. As a new dean of the faculty, uh, the message not working is particularly appealing to me. Um, look forward to um, uh, the lecture very much, and thank you very much for coming over to chair this lecture. And I think I need to hand you over this one as well. Thank you, everybody. Um, and thank you, Anthony. I am both honoured and moved by the invitation to chair Anthony Julius's inauguration of his chair in law and the arts. Honoured by the association with a distinguished interdisciplinary scholar and writer who's been interrogating the complex boundaries, antagonisms and complicities of law and art in a number of scintillating texts since this century's beginning, most notably in Idolizing Pictures, Idolatry, Iconoclasm and Jewish Art from 2001, and in Transgressions, The Offences of Art from 2002. In those books, Anthony mined the richly paradoxical scenes between law and its transgression the norm and its subversion, pointing to their permanent mutual implication in an extension and a development, I would say, of one of the great insights of psychoanalysis. That it is not law that engenders transgression, but transgression that engenders the law, um, in spite of what logic and chronology might tempt us to think. Among the many overlapping themes of Anthony's work, I think it is this one that we will be hearing about most this evening. Anthony is the author of two further books, his celebrated and controversial study of T.S. Eliot, Anti-Semitism and Literary Form, and <clears throat> perhaps best known for Trials of the Diaspora, A History of Anti-Semitism in England. In fact, both books make significant inroads into the literary history of anti-Semitism, into those moments where the ambiguities and the shadings of literary language are foreclosed, shut down, by the intrusions of a shameless stupidity. Which Anthony is about to remind us, if he will forgive this um, <clears throat> shameless filching from the lecture he's about to give, um, uh, is it, stupidity is memorably, memorably defined by Flaubert um, as the need for conclusions. What, for me, one of the most endearing aspects, um, uh, one of the most endearing red threads really running through Trials of the Diaspora 
is that one feels that, anti, that, that, that the greatest offense of anti-Semitism is not its egregious, arbitrary licensing of cruelty and exclusion, but its penchant for bad argument. Anthony will be exploring in a moment the and of law and the arts, and that breathtakingly simple and surprisingly complex conjunctive term that at once joins and divides words, bringing them together while settling, setting them at odds. As you will see and hear, the spirit animating Anthony's work is the opposite of stupidity as defined by Flaubert. It is the opposite of the need for conclusions. It is the pleasure of argument, which is so alive in all of his writing and in all, all of his thinking, of the miraculous capacity of the mind to open itself to different contradictory perspectives on the same question without the need for conclusions. Argument as in the careful precision of legal reasoning, but also the exhilarating narrative propulsion of the novelist. Argument then as one dimension of the and of law and the arts. I said at the beginning of this intro that I was moved as well as honored by the chance to introduce this lecture because Anthony is a scholar I admire, but more importantly, a friend that I cherish. I've taken much pleasure in the convergences and differences of our styles of thinking and writing as expressed and elaborated over many cafe tables. And this seems apposite given we're about to hear about friendships, friendships between men, but also the turbulent and rich friendship of two disciplines that have nothing and everything to do with each other. Anthony. Thank you, Josh, and thank you, Pete. <clears throat> I'm, uh, I'm very glad to, uh, to have joined, actually rejoined UCL in the mid-1990s. I did my PhD in the English faculty here, supervised by the late Dan Jacobson. Later in the decade, I did some teaching in the law faculty, but I would not have been able to come back to the university were it not for the support and perseverance of Professor Dame Hazel Gen, until very recently Dean of the faculty and Carl Gombrich, the director of the Liberal Arts Program, and I'm grateful to them both. I've been asked by friends and colleagues who only want to celebrate with me this appointment, but are perplexed by the title of my chair, what does this mean, Professor of Law and the Arts? And in my first exchanges on this question, I would say, well, I teach the relations between law and the arts. Uh, but that just prompted the further questions, what, what are those relations uh, and, and why are they worth teaching? Limiting myself to uh, literature among the arts, I first gave the formulaic answer in the received interdisciplinary categories, the law of literature, copyright, defamation and so on, the, the literature of the law, novels, plays that address legal themes, poems with legal language and so on, and law as literature, the, the literary qualities of uh, judgments. Um, and there's the same grouping for the visual arts, art law, uh, art works on legal themes, uh, and laws, tropes, and props. But this is really rather half-hearted and lukewarm. I think it manages to be both contrived and random. Um, schematic in its structuring, it just generates miscellanies. Uh, it's also partisan, which is bad enough, um, but it's uncertain in its loyalties, which is much worse. It oscillates witlessly between sentimentality, summoning literature to humanize law, and rigor summoning law to curb literary excesses, it can be the most undisciplined of interdisciplinary ventures, reductive, whimsical, um, arbitrary. So the perplexity makes sense, and the question deserves a better answer. 
Um, what I have to say this evening is my best answer, and it starts with Flaubert's great novel of French provincial life, Madame Bovary, uh, and it reaches its terminus with law and the arts in relations of intimate union and intimate enmity, hot and cold then, not ever lukewarm. So let me begin with Madame Bovary, serialized in 1856, then in early 1857, the subject of a prosecution for obscenity and blasphemy, and finally published in volume form in the spring of that year, following the author's acquittal. As most people know, the story concerns the discontented, reckless Emma Bovary. She is an enthusiastic but undiscriminating reader of books and an even more enthusiastic and even less discriminating chooser of men. She reads the wrong books or the right books in the wrong way and she makes a bad choice of husband but then makes an even worse choice in lovers. She muddles the sacred with the profane, matrimony with adultery, and metropolitan life with provincial life. She's that strange modern phenomenon, the unreflective rebel. She gets into debt and then she kills herself. Neither law nor literature come out of the novel well. Books turn Emma's head and the novel itself makes subversive parodic play with literary tropes and predecessor texts. One of the novel's lawyers is a thief, another is a sexual predator, and the third is one of Emma's worthless lovers. Following the title page, there are these two dedications. To marry Antoine Jules Senard, member of the Paris Bar, ex-president of the National Assembly and former Minister of the Interior, dear and illustrious friend, permit me to inscribe your name at the head of this book and even above its dedication, for it is to you above all that I owe its publication. As a result of your magnificent pleading, my work has acquired even for me, as it were, an unanticipated authority. Accept here, therefore, the homage of my gratitude, which as great as it could be, will never attain the level of your eloquence and your devotion. Pause. To Louis Brio. Who were these two men? Brio was a poet, a playwright, and a man of letters. He's now only remembered as Flaubert's dearest friend. They had been school classmates. They advised and corrected each other without deference, shared their enthusiasm for books, and encouraged and comforted each other in their writing. Flaubert coaxed Bouillet, do not let go, do not give up, follow your path, listen to no one. Bouillet advised Flaubert, Write a novel about a country doctor who kills himself on discovering his wife's adultery. It was to Bouillet that Flaubert read every Sunday the work in progress that became Madame Bovary. It was to Bouillet that he wrote his great letter in which he gave a definition of stupidity that is the key to all his fictions. Stupidity is the need for conclusions. To Flaubert's biographer, these men have left us with an example of legendary friendship. Each could have said of the other, he heard me, he understood me. When Bouillet died on 18th July 1869, Flaubert lamented, I have lost my advisor, my guide, my companion. And what of Senard? He was not just any member of the Paris Bar, he was one of its stars. We first come across him when Flaubert wishes to threaten the editors of the review serialising Madame Bovary. They had made cuts without his permission. He sought Senard's advice. It was the lawyer's eminence and, as we would now say, his connectedness 
that recommended him to the novelist. When Flaubert was prosecuted, Senard defended him. He did a good job. And Flaubert crowed, Maitre Senard's speech was splendid. He crushed the attorney from the Ministry of Justice who writhed in his seat. We flattened him. The courtroom was packed. I was in fine form. <laughs> Typical client. Um, <laughs> if I stopped here, it would be to celebrate a closer relation between law and the arts than any of those dull, tepid, interdisciplinary connections I listed earlier on. The union of the two men on the page could be taken as symbolic of the union of the two terms of my chair, the law, the arts. But consider these strange features. One dedication is very long, the other is very short. The long dedication denies its own status as a dedication. It invokes, but it then deviates from the alternative practice of inscription in which the author presents a signed copy of the book. The word friend is attached to the wrong name. What's going on here? This explanation opens out onto difficulties with any celebration of the union of law and the arts. First, the one dedication is a gift. The other is a payment. Flaubert merely writes Brouillet's name because he knows he doesn't need to say anything else. Think of Montaigne on his friend Etienne Laboueti. If you press me to say why I loved him, Montaigne writes, I cannot say other than because it was him, because it was me. Flaubert's words to Senard, extravagant, transparently overstated, are both a debt discharged and a down payment. It's an acknowledgement in the register of praise of something that the dedicatee has done to the advantage of the dedicator. Flaubert is not addressing a friend. Second, the Senar dedication is no affair of simple gratitude. It has subtexts, it misleads, and it conceals. Flaubert says so much to hide what he thinks. He hated the trial because it deflected attention from the novel. I am infuriated whenever I think of the trial, he told a friend. It has taken attention from Madame Bovary's artistic achievement, and I dislike art being associated with things alien to it. Flaubert valued Senard's eloquence not because it was truth-telling, still less revelatory of the novel, but because it was persuasive. It secured an acquittal. It did its job. The defense was a masterly combination of the irrelevant and the dishonest. Well-intentioned lies told for a client's benefit. An inscription, rather than the dedication, the delivery of just a copy of the book would have defeated Flaubert's purpose, which was to address many classes of reader in addition to Senard himself. The novel's readers in general, for a start, one effect of the trial and acquittal was to put the novelist in the lawyer's shadow. The dedication restates the novelist's authority while inviting us to admire his modesty. And then among the general class of readers, there are the more discriminating readers. The dedication may be read as a parody of those typically servile dedications in which the author overpraised his patron, the rich and powerful protector. Flaubert adds to the other parodies in the book the parody of this consecrated minor literary genre. And we must not overlook that most unwelcome class of readers, the censors. The writers of Second Empire France wrote in military shadows cast by police 
officials of the justice ministry, prosecutors and judges. To them, the dedication makes a gesture of defiance. It's a warning. By my flattery of Senard, I have secured his continuing protection. If you read the novel, you'll see that I've added passages that may provoke you, but back off. And last, the novelist addresses his fellow writers. Please commiserate with me. Look at what cost my triumph has been secured. The ignominy of having to dedicate a book to a lawyer. <laughs> and yet it's unavoidable. There is a sobriety in Flaubert's decision to offer this dedication to his defense lawyer. I do what I have to do in order to protect my vulnerable, precious work. Our sense of a happy union of law and the arts has become somewhat darker, somewhat more divided, perhaps. Eclipsing the impression we had on our first reading of the dedications of a collaborative collegial relation, we have now found something more problematic. Where then does this leave a chair in law and the arts? Not in a good place. Let me elaborate. In some respects, law and literature presents as utterly alien to each other. In other respects, they're entangled in antagonistic relations. Literature resisting law's embrace, law insisting on its rights over literature. Utterly alien, for sure, in their systemic properties. The legal system is a closed one. By radical contrast, insofar as we can even speak of a literary system at all, let alone an art system, it's an open one. Of the legal system, then, we can say it is an affair of jurisdictions, hierarchies and rules, of walls, boundaries, gated institutions, policed inhabitants. It has its mysteries, it has its rules of evidence, and it has its officials who must conform to public standards of behavior and appraise critically their own and each other's deviations. It is responsive to classification. In its practical applications, it submits to codification. In its theoretical exposition, its ideal form is the treatise. We find in the legal philosopher Jeremy Bentham's relentless taxonomizing the secret natural activity of the legal system itself. And its enemy is surprise. It requires regularity and certainty. It values predictability. It honors legitimate expectations. There is nothing arbitrary or capricious about it, at least when it's functioning optimally. It exists to address and contain the unexpected. It regulates, it disciplines, it orders. It is an enterprise, as Lon Fuller wrote, of subjecting human conduct to the governance of rules. And the literary system, at each point, it is locked in binary opposition to law. It has no sovereign. There are no barriers to entry. Anyone can write a novel. Anyone can pick up a novel. And for all the commitment in the last hundred or so years to elaborating schools of literary theory, a critic can still write correctly that reading well is about nothing more than making what is implicit in a book finally explicit. Literature has no officials. It teems, it is protean, it eludes all classifying tidiness. So far from submitting to classification, definitions wilt before it. And of course in literature, there are only surprises. As Ezra Pound wrote, literature is news that stays news. It transgresses, it generates scandals, 
Let Walt Whitman speak for literature here. I speak the password primeval. I give the sign of democracy. Through me, many long, dumb voices, voices of the interminable generations of prisoners and slaves, voices of the diseased and despairing, and of thieves and dwarves, and of the rights of them the others are down upon, of the deformed, trivial, flat, foolish, despised, fog in the air, beetles rolling balls of dung, through me, forbidden voices, voices of sexes and lusts, voices veiled, and I remove the veil, voices indecent by me clarified and transfigured. This is from Whitman's great poem, Song of Myself. Law and literature are utterly alien too in their respective modalities. Law privileges proposition over story and the monologic over the dialogic. It tends towards the single authoritative voice. Of course, no set of legal institutions or prescriptions exists apart from the narrative that locate them and give them meaning. But the story always involves an account of how the law came into being, a primal scene that tends to be subversive of the law's authority, or at least embarrassing, as tales of origin invariably are. Literature, by contrast, favours stories over propositions and the dialogic over the monologic. It asks us to trust the tale, not the teller. We rightly suspect novels with a thesis, novels that set out to prove a point. Storytelling, it's been claimed, is the way one speaks one's conflicts with the law. What then of the challenge of interpretation? How are legal and literary texts to be read? Legal interpretation works according to principles of economy of meaning, coherence, sobriety, deference and urgency. It strives towards judgments. It gives closure. It favours the definite, the certain, the final. It privileges practical reason over speculative reason. Literary interpretation works according to the contrary principles of plenitude or inaccessibility of meaning, dividedness, wonder, disrespect, and leisureliness. The liveliness of the institution of literary study depends in part, it has been said, on the fact that arguments about the meaning of a work are never settled. For literature, closure is always foreclosure. Consider as a category of interpretation the judgment. A forensic judgment is always final, subject to limited appeal, while a literary judgment in its very form has to be provisional. A forensic judgment invites a sanction. Every literary judgment invites a dissent. A, lit a forensic judgment has a purpose beyond itself. A literary judgment is complete in itself. A literary judgment invites dispute. A forensic judgment of a literary work mostly invites protest or mockery. To put a text on trial, how bizarre. Is there any comfort then to be had in their philosophizing about themselves, their self-understanding? Is there some hint of convergence, even some overlap here? Not a bit. In jurisprudence, we find a combination of modesty of ambition and assuredness of authority. Here is Herbert Hart a major legal philosopher on the modesty. Jurisprudence, he writes, trembles uncertainly on the margin of many subjects. And here is Ronald Dworkin, another major legal philosopher on the assured authority. Lawyers and judges, he writes, are the working 
political philosophers of a democratic state. Hart and Dworkin are both right. Literary theory, by radical contrast, combines immodesty of ambition, it swaggers, it appropriates, it incorporates with an utter absence of authority. It has no command, it leaves everything unchanged. In jurisprudence, there is a measurable distance from the grounded, vocational, regulated activities of legal practitioners. In literary theory, there is an immeasurable distance from the elevated, mysterious, unregulated process of artistic creation. Last, let's consider what they think of each other. Law's perspective on literature is a matter of fact, perhaps best characterized as an insouciant disregard. It presents itself both as enabler and obstacle to literary expression, but mostly it's the threat, the menacing presence. Law is the regulator, literature the regulated. Law is the vocation, literature is the leisure pursuit. The appellate judge, Lord Burkitt, speaking, one feels for many English lawyers, confided to an audience, I enjoy occasional reading in bed, with the bolster and the pillows properly arranged. <laughs> Literature's disregard for law is much more complicated. It's best characterized as a strenuous, not an insouciant disregard. Law is often the despised vocation to be rejected for literature. Flaubert, as a young man, wrote from Paris, when people speak to me about the bar, saying this young fellow will make a fine trial lawyer because I'm broad in the shoulders and have a booming voice, I confess it turns my stomach. I don't feel myself made for such a completely materialistic, trivial life. <laughs> he failed his exams. In a defensive reflex, literature assigns to the poet the superior standing. Literature is more than a supplement here to legal studies, it's a humanistic rebuke to the abstract, rationalistic, instrumental law, an ethical corrective to scientific, technocratic visions. It teaches empathy and compassion. It exposes laws, failures, and limits. Literature finds itself at odds with law and legal processes. Law suspects that literature and art look favorably on crime. Literature and art, for their part, despise law's perversely reductive, life-denying and punitive understanding of transgression. Law does not understand transgression's beauty. It holds art's celebration of the transgressive to be precious, misconceived, dangerous. The one is committed to the unfettered realizing of our imaginative capacities, the other to the regulating of our words and deeds. Art exasperates law, law oppresses art. Conceived then as systems in their modalities, in their interpretive practices, in their self-understandings and understandings of each other, Law and literature, perhaps, are most amenable to contrasting or antagonistic accounts. If we're to speak at all of their relations, they seem best to be understood by reference to a principle of mutual disregard and a principle of mutual antagonism. The first principle recognizes that law and literature just do different things. We make different uses of them. They play different roles in our lives. Law contemplates the world in order to regulate it. Literature contemplates the world in order 
to render it. And even when they appear to be doing the same or similar things, such as interpreting texts, these practices turn out on closer examination to be quite different. Well, what about the mutual antagonism? Law and literature, the arts generally, frequently are engaged in hostilities with each other. Their collisions have outcomes that are at best no better than unprincipled compromises. In contested terrain, they struggle for mastery. Consider Shakespeare. His work is full of assertions of literature's supremacy over law. In The Winter's Tale, for example, he says this, speaking in the name of Coric time. It is in my power to overthrow law and in one self-born hour to plant and overwhelm custom. More modestly, Fielding in Tom Jones, the novelist Fielding, wrote, I am the founder of a new province of writing, so I'm at liberty to make what laws I please. But Shakespeare's more imperious claim comes closer to expressing literature's inner drive. I am in charge, says the writer. I can overthrow law. Where does this lead? To the imperative, we are required to take sides. Are we on the side of the one or the many, of order or imagination? Different writers cast the choice in different terms. For Blake, it is God or the devil. For Nietzsche, it is the Apollonian or the Dionysian. But it comes to the same thing. We cannot dedicate ourselves to both. It's an ancient imperative, this demand that we choose. It was already ancient when Plato formulated it. In Book 10 of The Republic, Socrates refers to the ancient quarrel between poetry and philosophy. And here philosophy stands for law. If we are to uphold the one, Socrates says, we have to banish the other. When I began to develop these thoughts, I wondered whether my chair wouldn't better be named law versus the arts, or perhaps even law or the arts. And I have to say, they're quite appealing to me, these revised titles. They get at the sense that we have that understanding law and the arts is an understanding that, that involves the antithetical. The two barely talk to each other, and when they do, they row. They are not to be yoked together. We should respect their condition of a common alienation. Can we step back from this? Law and the arts may each say to us, choose. But we can respond, no, we won't. Why submit to this imperative of choice? Socrates himself relented just a little. If we can come up with arguments to justify poetry, he says, right at the end of the Republic, then it can stay. Let's look again at the dedications. They contain my whole argument. If we consider not their content, but instead their coexistence, what do they communicate to us? First, that Flaubert needed both Bouillet and Senard, both poet and lawyer. The Sunday readings were an essential part of the process. And of course, notwithstanding Flaubert's sly slide from the third to the first person in his account of the trial, I was in fine form. For sure, Senard's representation was decisive to the outcome. Return to Flaubert's fellow writers as an audience for this dedication. I read Flaubert like this. He says to the writers, there has been a shift in the regime of writing. We no longer need a patron to get our work out. We can rely on the general public to buy it. But we do need lawyers to protect our work once published. Lawyer up. 
Second, we see that the novel was born in contention. Flaubert started it in strong reaction to Bouillet's advice to burn what he was then writing. Its serialization was the subject of deep dispute with the editor. Flaubert was admonished by the court that acquitted him. The Catholic Church put the novel on its list of prohibited books and local priests exercising their own initiative forbade parishioners to read it. What can we infer from these things? One, that a society is only complete when it has both law and the arts. And two, notwithstanding this, that law and the arts will usually be in contention with each other. We need them both, even if they can't get along with each other. To cast these inferences as projects is to define my own undertaking as professor of law and the arts. To teach the need for both law and the arts, to teach the conflicts between law and the arts. The first project, ask the question, what is lost to a society without law, without the arts? Hobbes responds for law. Without law, he writes security, there is no place for industry, no navigation, no commodious building, no arts, no letters. We can add, on behalf of the arts, a society without arts and letters is not fully a society. Law's purpose is to make us secure. Literature's purpose is to gladden our hearts. How absurd to be asked to choose between security and joy. We should strive for both. Law provides the structure of a settled state. It provides the mechanism for the resolution of conflicts. It constitutes authorities and it thereby creates the conditions for us to live will. well. This is among mankind's earliest intuitions. Living well means, among other things, pursuing pleasure. Literature and the arts are realms of pleasure, often difficult, challenging pleasure. Literature is playful. It plays with ideas, with principles, with allegiances. It is not solemn about them. It is subversive because it is committed to pleasure. As the great French critic Roland Barthes once wrote, the literary text is that uninhibited person who shows his behind to the political father. Literature is where everything is attacked, dismantled. We need the rule. We need the transgression of the rule. And let us add, the transgression itself needs the rule. And the second project? It can start from Barthes' insight, which has been restated recently thus. Literature is a source of scandal. This is what defines it. It is a resistant and illegitimate discourse. And so we find we are back to conflict. Artists will always force the boundaries of what is held to be art. It follows that they will also force the boundaries of what is lawful. Here, all is struggle. Values and principles collide with nothing conceded on either side. These conflicts are daily with us. Should artists who abuse actors even commit crimes against them be banned? Should their works no longer be shown or performed? Oscar Wilde raised the question. It's being raised again now with urgency. Should literary works that express sentiments implicated in systems of oppression, documents of barbarism as well as of civilization, be suppressed? Should artworks be retitled if their original titles contain racially or confessionally offensive language? 
Should we empower religious groupings like the Inquisition of former times to deliver writers and artists to the civil power with the instruction, they offend us, deal with them? Should trigger warnings be added to novels and plays? Should we pull down statues that honor men and women whom we now wish to execrate? These are complicated questions. Art has its own moral force, Iconoclasm has its own creative drive. The object here in the pursuit of this project is not to strive for resolutions, still less to formulate policies. It is instead to seek to do justice to both sides, to make the best case for each in their mutual troubled contention. We should not deny the provisional quality of any judgment on these conflicts. We should not deny the existence of the costs and trade-offs in such judgments. And we should certainly scorn all judicial cliches, balance, balancing exercise, and so on, as if one could thereby purge the conflicts between law and the arts of their blood and their energy. We should approach these conflicts from both sides with the instincts of the litigator, who is a simple soul and is only satisfied if he has someone to love and someone to kill. <laughs> An insight that literature itself delivers. We need these conflicts. William Blake, speaking for literature, affirmed attraction and repulsion reason and energy, love and hate are necessary to human existence. Without contraries, there is no progression. Law and the Arts, as a title, is no more than a hybrid of two other titles, Union Contest, Law with Arts, law versus arts, law and arts united, law and arts in conflict. One chair, two projects. Let's look one last time at these dedications. What does dedication mean? We might think commitment of a kind that is superior, perhaps even excludes all other commitments. We can only be dedicated to one person, one subject, one cause, surely. If this is right, then it's a puzzle, isn't it, that there are two dedications to this novel. What is this promiscuity? Not promiscuity. On the contrary, in his accumulating of dedications, Flaubert makes the valuable suggestion that even our dedications can be plural. They can express commitments that do not require the demotion, the subordination of other commitments. And they need be no less passionate, no less ardent, no less cherished for that. Thank you, UCL, for providing me with the forum in which I may find a new dedication. And let me also thank you here tonight for helping to mark an event of great importance to me and which has made me very happy, one in which I take great pride. Uh, I won't take up too much more of your time. Uh, I do find that a hard act to follow. Um, but there were a number of binaries of oppositions that Anthony unfolded for us in the course of the lecture. 
And the one that I wanted to pick up on very briefly was between predictability, order, regularity, on the one hand, associated with law, and surprise, associated with literature. When the lecture opened, we were very quickly given a rubric for the study of the relationship between literature and law, which struck me as exemplary in its consistency, its systematicity. We had law in literature, um, literature under the exercise of law. We had the representation of law in literature. We had legal texts as literary texts. It struck me that Anthony was organizing the field for us in a way that was both seamless and rich and productive. And then he took his own scheme and called it, to my slight embarrassment, contrived, random, partisan, uncertain, witless, sentimental, reductive, and whimsical. Um, Only in the nicest way, yes. I, I, I felt at that moment um, that it wasn't so much his own scheme that was being described, but myself. Um, and in a way, all of us, because one of the things that Anthony does is he carries us along on the waves of a kind of seamless rhetorical lulling, giving us the rec regularity, the predictability, the containment, and the order of a rigorous argument. But what is, I think, so important about the lecture and what I'm so looking forward to in the long-awaited, extraordinary work from which this arises. Extraordinary, I know, because he's been unfolding it for me now over a number of years. Um, is that it then introduces the element of surprise. Um, it shows, indeed, it's behind to the patrician father. Um, <clears throat> the energy of Aegon that Antony ended with um, is not simply an Aegon, uh, a conflictual energy that he's described for us, but one that he has performed for us with his customary gusto and penetrating intelligence. And I want to thank him very much for, for giving that to us. Thank you, thank you very much, Josh. Um, it um, f final stage of this uh, inaugural lecture. I, uh, it is my task to uh, formally inaugurate Anthony, but I cannot refrain from making a few comments also on his lecture, which, um, uh, as he painted the picture of what I thought was the trial of law versus the arts, as he put it. Um, really made, made me doubt very much whether we had taken the right decision of uh, starting a chair in law and the arts. Uh, and, and then I thought, uh, when I heard him uh, uh, sort of depict that trial and engage in it, that I, I wasn't sure whether I heard the rhetoric of the trial lawyer or the rhetoric of the literary critic. Um, and so in, uh, I, would, uh, I would say and I would add to that that in terms of rhetoric, uh, an analysis, we will never be able, uh, any of us, to attain the level of your eloquence and your devotion, as Flaubert said. And so in that sense, it is probably right to have a chair of law and the arts, and I, I hereby now formally uh, inaugurate you, uh, Anthony Julius, as that chair at UCL. Thank you very much. <laughs>